British Spring actually has a dual meaning. Uh, first and foremost, it refers to the title of Silone's most famous work, Fontamara. So in that sense, it's a bitter spring, a bitter fountain, a bitter source of uh, water. Um, but I tell this anecdote at the end of the book where Silone is driving through Abruzzo, you know, when he's older, and he and a friend come across an almond tree that is flowering in the middle of the winter time. And, and the, the friend is amazed at this, and Silone tells him the story, a kind of folk tale that they tell in Abruzzo, which is that when uh, the Holy Family was fleeing into Egypt away from Herod's assassins, uh, St. Joseph was leading the family away out of Bethlehem, and in order to hide, the Madonna and child climbed up into the tree, and the tree immediately burst into bloom, these beautiful white blossoms to hide the Madonna and child, while St. Joseph slept at the bottom. Uh, but Siloni says uh, it's a, a kind of precarious beauty because in the middle of the winter you can still uh, the tree can still die of frost and, and then what happens the the flowers fall off and what happens is that the almonds when they are harvested later on are very bitter so it's a kind of bitter spring cioè una primavera amara in other words uh, so bitter spring water and the bitter spring uh, of the season as well. Yes, yeah, Siloni was from a small town called Pescine in Abruzzo, not far from where the recent earthquake took place. And um, he was not from the peasant class. Uh, his, his family owned some land. Uh, they were not what might be called immorti di fame or caffoni, you know, really poor, poor peasants in the Mezzogiorno. Uh, but still, Siloni always felt a kind of uh, sympathy or empathy with the really poor, poor peasants, the, the, the most destitute uh, of the poor. And that actually pushed him uh, as a young man, even in his teen years, to, into politics. Then this was compounded by the fact that his father left Pescina in 1911 to go to Brazil to look for work. And as soon as he gets off the boat in Rio de Janeiro, he's confronted with this spectacle of uh, workers uh, striking in Brazil and the Brazilian police are trying to force the Italian immigrants to take those jobs at lower wages. The father is so disgusted, he turns around, gets on the boat, and goes back to Italy. Uh, the problem is that in 1911, he, he dies, uh, and in 1915, there is this incredible earthquake in Piscina, uh, which kills Silone's mother, uh, whom he had to dig out uh, out of the rubble by himself. And the only person who survived that now in the family was a younger brother, Romolo, who was trapped under the rubble for five days. So Silone and Romolo are taken in by uh, Catholic schools, schools that had been set up by uh, Luigi Orione. Some of them had been set up after the 1908 earthquake. And uh, he and his brother uh, are taught in these Catholic schools. And Silone is attracted to a certain type of Christianity, but he's very much... Um, uh, angered and disappointed in, in the institutional church. For example, he wrote many times that during the First World War, while you know millions of people were getting killed on the Western Front, uh, the church was obsessed with these kind of banal and ridiculous things, like what kinds of bathing suits women were wearing at the beach. Um, when you know peasants were starving to death, uh, the church refused to allow peasants to organize into unions and things like this. And Saloni said, how could how could someone who has a strong ethical and moral sense stay in a church like this? And, and it's ironic that he had this kind of very strong religious and ethical sense of the world, and that's what actually pushed him into the Socialist Party. There are many different uh, Silone affairs, or uh, Casi Silone, you know, you might say. Uh, the first is the fact that uh, Silone was never accepted by the Italian literary establishment. Um, one of the reasons may be because he was uh, not a member of any political party. After he was expelled by the Communist Party, Siloni became sort of like a black sheep on the left. He wasn't embraced by the Christian Democrats on the right, and he wasn't embraced by the Communist Party on the left. So that was one problem. And then Italian uh, literary critics have to ask themselves the question, uh, why is it that Siloni is so uh, uh, apprezzato, um, valued, appreciated uh, all around the world, including like, you know, even Japan and India where his books are translated, 
and especially let's say in France and Germany in the United States where he was a very popular writer why is it that Saloni is so appreciated abroad and here in Italy nobody understands Saloni so that's one Caso Saloni then uh, there is another Caso Saloni that uh, breaks out after the Second World War and then again in 1968 which was the scandal of Silone supposedly spying for the CIA. And this has the basis in the fact that um, during the Second World War, while Silone was in exile in Switzerland, he was working with Alan Dulles of the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which was the forerunner of the CIA. Um, now, uh, there's a Swiss scholar who has put all of these documents online, and they're accept, uh, accessible to anybody who has the time or the interest to look at them, and it's very clear that Saloni was not quote-unquote spying for the CIA. What he was doing was trying to help the Allies end the Second World War as quickly as possible, to try to end uh, the fascist regime, to try to end the Nazi occupation of Italy, and also to try to prevent uh, the Italian Communist Party from coming to power in a post-war Italy. Saloni thought that if the Italian Communist Party came to power, it would have been a kind of political and moral disaster. And then the last Caso Silone is this one that we mentioned about uh, Dario B uh, Biocca and uh, Mauro Canale, that he was uh, n not spying for the CIA, but in the 1920s, while he was a member of the Italian Communist Party, he was writing these letters or spying uh, for the fascist regime. Well, 1996, uh, Dario Biocca finds these uh, documents in the Archivio Centrale de dello Stato in Rome, uh, in Silone's uh, police file, uh, they appear to be letters. Um, some of them are addressed to a fascist official in Rome, Guido Bellone, who is a kind of ambiguous figure. He's not a member of the OVRA, which is the fascist secret police. He's a member of the Questura di Roma, so a, a member, let's say, of the quote-unquote normal police, not of the political fascist police. And then the question becomes, what was this relationship between Silone and Bellone? And when did they meet? Uh, when did they start writing these letters? What was in these letters? How, how uh, important were these letters? If you read these, uh, these documents, uh, uh, Bjorka claims that they are very specific and that they are telling Bellone and the police uh, who is in what city, who is using what pseudonym, uh, who is writing what, who has what kind of position in the party, and uh, oftentimes these documents are coming from cities, let's say uh, Paris or Lugano or Zurich or Berlin, where Salone also happens to be around the same time. So, circumstantially, it looks very incriminating. Uh, some of the documents, this is also debatable, the question is, to what extent did the fascist police already know this information? Because Silone was not the only person who was supposedly writing these letters or being an informer. Uh, there is also the thesis, the hypothesis that Silone went to the Italian Communist Party and said, look, I know this guy in Rome. He works for the police. What do you want me to do? And it's possible that the, that the communist said, okay, keep up this relationship, keep writing to him, tell him generic things that of course we already know that they know they know that we know we know that they know that kind of thing but try to find out what they know about us so in that sense Silone is not let's say a double agent he's like a triple agent you know he's spying for both sides at the same time that's a possibility um, this was first this idea was first broached um, uh, years ago uh, but the people who would have been able to confirm this theory that the Italian Communist Party, someone like Umberto Terracini, who was the number three man in the Italian Communist Party, uh, he's dead. And most of these people are all dead. So there is no way to confirm this because there are no written documents. And of course, something like this would have been done verbally. It's not like something that they would have written down in a document.